Hello, we are recording now. This is meeting number five of the Cyclodge series about large language models. And today we have five speakers who will tell about different projects in the emerging ecosystem of closure around large language models. We'll begin by everybody introducing themselves and then we'll just begin with the first talk. All talks will be short and we'll have just very few tiny questions between them and then and then we'll have some time for discussion. And to the people listening to us, yes, this is shared publicly on YouTube, but, but some of the discussion will take place after we stop recording. So please know, you should join the meetings because the discussions are always great. And yeah, so um, I guess I'll ask the speakers to say something about themselves. So Daniel, would you like to say something? Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Daniel and I've been doing closure something like uh, uh, more than 10 years. Uh, in 2013, I started uh, closure Israel Meetup. And the last um, two years, I've been uh, working for uh, F5, a company uh, that does uh, security products. And I've been laid off in uh, June. So uh, that's um, uh, quite fresh. Uh, um, I've been doing compiler stuff with uh, at a five, so kind of um, more like hardcore uh, technical stuff. But uh, actually, I'm going back to some kind of um, passion of mine or, or interest of mine, which is more humanist design. And now I'm building user interfaces um, augmented by AI. So uh, I, I will, I will, when my turn will come, I will show you a demo of what I've been doing. So that's it. Thank you very much. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, and maybe Adrian, would you like to say something? Hi, I'm Adrian. I'm uh, the author of Yamada.clj, which I'll talk about in a bit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and Cameron, I guess this is the right order. Hi there, uh, my name's Cameron. I've been a Clojure developer since about 2015 um, here in the US, and I'll be talking about multi-GPT. Thank you so much. And Rupert, hello Rupert. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Rupert. I am a developer based in London. Uh, I've been working in Clojure for more than 10 years uh, and I've been spending a lot of time in the sort of AI machine learning space. Uh, currently I'm a CTO at a London startup. Um, yep, yeah, so that's it. Thank you so much. And Chikimatas? Yeah, hi. Well, Gigas Zigas is also fine, a short name. Uh, I'm based in Lithuania, Milnus. Um, been working as lots of you with Clojure for over a decade, like seasoned uh, developer. I worked in Clojure, but plus also in natural language processing. So all that new AI happenings is not really new for me. So, so different, let's say, phases of that. Well, this is by by no means the most exciting iteration of AI development. I'm working on Bosquet um, um, library, well, oper LLM operations library, which I'm now kind of guiding towards uh, agents uh, instead of uh, generic. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about that more later. Fantastic. So these were our five speakers. And now I'll ask each of the other friends to say something if they wish. And please tell me if you don't wish to say anything. Um, so uh, maybe Zachary, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm actually relatively new uh, to the Clojure environment. Um, I went through uh, Clojure for the Brave and True just last year. Um, I am personally a, a software developer in the embedded world, uh, private, or up until recently, uh, doing mainly C programming, um, and then I re then I moved into a platform programming uh, position where I am now uh, primarily programming in Python. Um, but in my free time, I find myself keep on turning back to Clojure. Uh, I find it very interesting, and this is my first meetup, so it's nice to meet all of you. <laughs> that is great. Hello. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ines, I, I never remember if I say the name right. <laughs> That's okay. I, I will call myself a closure enthusiast, 
ruling by my self closure for long years. Not work, uh, I have one, one year of professional working as software developer, but not, not you know, and some part time. But I like closure and interesting and in, in, in LLMs. So I want to hear what's happening in the closure and the LLMs together. I'm trying to to make some something mine in some project where I would use both. And learning Python <laughs> at the same time. Okay, that's it. Ray, thank you so much. Uh, hello, Jose. Would you like to say something? Hello, uh, my name is Javier. I'm close for Jose Javier. Oh, um, Javier. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I prefer Javier. Um, my experience with, with Clojure is very short, no, no longer than, than two years. Um, I'm, inter I'm interested in LLMs. I, I'm making um, a chat app um, in, in order to, <clears throat> to deal with, with a specific uh, knowledge base, the, the, the proof of the German sociologist, Niklas Luhmann. So I, I'm making a rack, a retrieval augmented uh, generation app. Yeah, and I'm experimented with, with that. Lang chain and cohere, closure SDK cohere, and PG vector, the, this extension for Postgres as a vector database. That's my basic setup. That is thank great. You. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So now we have another story we're hoping to hear in the future. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Ash. Would you like to say something? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ash. And I work as a researcher in the computing science department of Stirling University in Scotland. Um, my research project is actually interested in applying LLMs in the context of um, social and welfare help systems. Um, nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, hello, Wade and a friend. Would you to say something? Hello. Uh... Yeah, my friend and I are working uh, in the LLM space, AI space on a spiritual AI. Um, I have personally worked with Clojure for about eight years, um, worked on Data Hike previously, and I just open sourced a sort of chatbot interface uh, that's like sort of replicates uh, OpenAI's chat interface um, using Electric and Data Hike and currently working on getting it so it's installable onto like all the operating systems and yeah, a bunch of interesting stuff, which I can talk about at another time. And, and that's my friend Hanjo. I'm Hanjo. I have a PhD in machine learning. Right now I'm looking to make the uh, field of prompt engineering more rigorous by testing uh, prompts to validate that it's actually adjusting the model to be more intelligent using um, basically simple classification tasks. So I'm an independent researcher, I would say. Thank you so much. Nice to meet. Um, hello, Sean. W would you like to say something? Um, I'm just an old list person uh, who's still interested in this stuff. That's it. Thank you so much. And Tim. Hello again, Tim. Hello. Um, I'm a new list person uh, who is also taking an interest in data science. So this seems like the convergence of the two. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, so in the intros, we heard about at least three more projects that we're hoping to hear about in the future meetups. And also the five projects we will be talking about today, all of them uh, deserve a meetup of themselves. So let us use this space uh, in the coming meetups uh, wisely. And please reach out if you wish to tell us your story more fully in the coming times. And we will now begin with Daniel about Cohere and the Cohere SDK. And you have 10 minutes and then after that, like a brief time for questions. Thank you very much. So what I want to do here is do a demo of um, a uh, user interface, which is augmented by AI. Um, I'm going to touch about uh, the port I've done for Cl uh, Cohere later, uh, the Co Clo Cohere Closure SDK. But first, um, I'm doing this. I'm going to show you a demo which has nothing to do with it. Um, but it does have 
but it, it is actually what I'm trying to achieve with uh, Cohere as well. Um, but in this case, in this demo, I'm going to use another system which does image recognition. It's called Imaga, I think, Imaga with two, G, two Js. And so the, the demo is going to be um, a very short um, showcase of a user interface that allows a user to post on Reddit. Um, and in this case, I've been scratching my own itch. Um, I'm, I'm an I'm a amateur photographer, and I post uh, pictures on uh, Fujifilm, which is uh, a Reddit uh, sub. Uh, uh, for for Fujifilm camera users, uh, which is ridiculous if you think about it, because pictures pictures are pictures, but and it doesn't matter which camera you use. But you know, this is the internet, and people like to show off their pictures in the in a forum uh, where other people uh, share the same camera, which <laughs> again is completely ridiculous. But that's how it is. Um, but um, the thing is that these subreddits have rules. So, for example, on Fujifilm, you have to the title needs to be um, needs to include the lens that you you use, and that is because people want to know which lens you've used. Because if they like the picture, they want to do something similar themselves. They want to know what lens you you need for that and stuff like that. So that is one rule, and the other rule is that you have to say if you've been uh, post processing the picture uh, or not, and then you can just upload the picture and that, that's it. Now, um, there is nothing complicated to it, but what I wanted to do is try to find out if I can make uh, something, a delightful user experience. Uh, this is what I want to, to, uh, to play with, like um, a delightful user interface where um, I don't need to see which lens I've, I don't need to remember which lens I've used. I just, um, select a file, uh, my, my image file. For example, here I have a, um, a file of that I've been, to, that I've shot in China in a recent trip. And here you can see that the server immediately tells me uh, which, which lens this is from retrieving the exit data. And what happens is that the, um, when I select from the, the a lot of things are happening behind the scenes. Um, and we're gonna do another one just to show you the, the general um, workflow. So I select a file and immediately what is happening is um, that locally the file is passed in the browser and already we can see, we can show the first information um, the first info pane which has the name and the size and the type this i don't need to do any kind of uh, request to get this information this is uh, known by the browser so i can display the image and the first info pane immediately the regarding the the film simulation and the lens and the make and the model this i need to to do some kind of analysis of the jpeg and I do this on the server. So what happens is when you when I select the file, it I, I upload it I upload it to my server, um, which is a closure backend, and I extract the exif from the, the 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 portion of metadata of the image, and then I pass this with the library, and I retrieve the lens model. So I don't need to you know sometimes I don't remember which lens I've been using. So this is the the safest uh, bet, and and then I can already uh, assemble the title that I will post on Reddit. Um, I put it he here in the input, but at the same time, there is something else that happens in the background. Um, I'm querying within the browser a service uh, called Imaga, which is an AI service, image recognition, which they have an API for, for, for uh, image recognition and it works in the browser. So it's closure script direct, directly. And I retrieve the, the keywords. Um, what it thinks- Five I've... minutes, by the way. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So it retrieves uh, the labels. Uh, it gives me um, the keywords that it thinks uh, describes the image. And I can click on, for, first of all, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's far from perfect. 
So I have a whole, this, this image is dark. So it, I can see from the keywords, it didn't do a great job, but I can understand it's, um, it doesn't matter so much because this is just, this is the portion of the, the user interface, which I consider AI augmented and you can't rely on the AI. You, you can never, even um, if you're going to, if I'm going to, if you're going to do generative AI for copy, for example, or uh, chat, you know, uh, if anything that comes from the from the from the AI needs needs to come first in a user editable form, so that the user can can uh, change it. So I can here click on the on the on the labels, and when I click, it it just appends it to the to the input here, and I can. If it was correct, I could say, uh, because I can't see anything correct here, actually. Uh, tow truck, it's not tow truck, it's, uh, but anyway, I can I can help myself and and uh, um, edit it. And, and uh, so here in this case, I, I want to reject all the labels and I want to see, I want to say a night a food stall. And then I'm going to click on post on uh, Fujifilm. And then, I get uh, the the result that it's published. I'm going to wait a little bit to see if normally I should get a link that I can click on to see the posts. But of course, this is a live demo, so chances are that it didn't work. And of course, since now I'm sharing my screen, I can't really see what's going on. So, uh, demo, demos, demos, yeah. Yeah, but it is okay, even the, it doesn't matter you know, the format, yeah. Um, would, would you like to say something about Cohere? We have yeah. about two minutes, yeah. So, so uh, the rest will be um, uh, devoted to Cohere. Um, the, for the same, the same, a reason that I'm I've been doing this this interface. I want to do a user interface that allows uh, merchants to do copy for uh, products. Um, people who sell on Shopify, they tend to make descriptions which can be better augmented by uh, copy that comes from the AI. The AI. This is one thing that the AI does very well. Uh, you know, like uh, we might not be there yet for general uh, intelligence, but for copy, uh, generating copy, AIs are, are pretty amazing. And so um, what what is difficult is, and where you can be competitive as a, as, as a sole developer, as an entrepreneur, uh, competitive with these giant companies who do LLM products, which cost, which, you know, they invest millions of dollars and they have teams of uh, researchers and stuff like that what where you can compete as a loan devel developer is uh, by 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 designing into humanist uh, user interfaces so really really sleek uh, nice good working well working uh, well designed well thought or uh, well thought out uh, interfaces which is not easy to do and you, you can Im imagine yourself very easily trying to make a uh, for example, if you, you if you go to OpenAI or Cohere, they have a, a interface for the users to check to check out to test their their uh, their product. So you have a um, a playground, or they call this a playground, or they call this a you know where you put the prompt and where you can um, make the corrections and stuff like that. So this 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 design of of interface is actually the old the old school um, craftsmanship uh, oriented. Uh, you know, thing that we've been, that is nothing new, uh, that has nothing to do with, with AI. Um, so, um, because I, I designed these systems uh, in Clojure and Clojure Script, I want to have a uh, an API in Clojure Script and Cohere had a, an API in Python. Um, so I've ported it, um, well, excuse me, the, the API is REST, but uh, the SDK, which allows to do some stuff that you cannot do only with REST calls, um, what is provided in uh, in a Python SDK, and this is I've ported it 
something like 75% of it. So, um, uh, but I think this is not really, there's not much more. I mean, you, you're welcome to ask me questions about it, but it's a, just a straightforward port. So you can, the port, the my closure port just uh, allows you to to do these requests and, and the workflow that, that you do normally in Python, you can do it in closure. Uh, but again, this I considered to to be the, the the dirty work behind the scenes, and it's not really interesting. What what I'm interested in is is the the experience I can give my users uh, with that, and this is why I, sh I chose to to show you the demo with the the demo that is ready with the with the image recognition software. So that's for me, I think. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to um, to answer you. Thank you so much, Daniel. And, and yeah, on both topics, we can always keep going on um, future meetings. And very curious, of course. And does anybody have a brief question or comment? Tim? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is Cohere uh, not running locally? You're calling out to that. That's like a cloud thing, or is that? Yeah, Co Cohere is, uh, is like OpenAI. It runs in the cloud. It's an API that you uh, that you can use. But you don't okay. run, and don't they run. only provide an, an API. Or, they only provide a, a Python. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an open AI. This this is not a local LLM. This is not an LLM that you install locally. I'm sure here people are. Uh, there will be somebody who talks about the Yama or Llama, and that's that's a local LLM. But uh, Cohere is a uh, is a cloud provider. Okay. Yeah. I just I never heard of it, so I was just. Well, it, okay. Sure so just. The, because I'm not working for Cohere and I have nothing to do with Cohere, I just did a port. But Cohere is a uh, competitor to OpenAI. They are big. They have been they have, they have been established by Googlers. Uh, some some of the founders are, are uh, signed the paper on um, um, uh, a very important paper on on uh, LLM research uh, called Attention. And Attention is the technical term uh, in LLM parlance. To to uh, to to designate the the way you you capture context. Uh, so um, this was a, a groundbreaking paper. So these people know what they're doing. They have they are big, yeah. and they do the service they provide is enterprise oriented. They are less ambitious than OpenAI. They don't want to solve uh, general intelligence. They they want to provide solid services in the um, data science and, uh, and natural language processing field. So you can do uh, classification, tokenization, uh, gen generative AI, um, and and stuff like that. The the, the, the usual sus suspects. Uh, so did you open source your port of the yeah. SDK? Yes, it's uh, open source. It has the same um, the same license as the, the their SDK, the Python SDK from Cohere. Okay, that that would be awesome to look at because I'm new to Closure, but I have some Python experience. So looking at your port might be insightful for just learning how Closure idioms work better. Yeah, so the, I've invested quite some time in the README to make it uh, easy to uh, start, you know, doing these uh, basic tasks. So uh, there is an example of how to do um, uh, generative AI, uh, so generating copy and uh, um, classification. There are some examples, and they are really one-to-one -one with the Python SDK. And I hope uh, the README will be useful because this is the main the main uh, document to, to use to to learn how to uh, to use the, the SDK. And then also you uh, mentioned the UI. Um... What uh, CSS library were you using for that web page? So I have this very base. I yeah, so maybe actually, maybe now I'll stop you. But yeah. Maybe we can come <laughs> back to it in a future meeting or in the discussion afterwards. Sorry for stopping both of you. That's fascinating. And we we'll go on now with uh, and Daniel and Tim. Thank you so much for this chat. And Adrian, thank you. About thank you very much. Diana. Thanks, Adrian. So we have. 10 minutes. Um, cool. Can everybody see the web page here? Yes. Yep. OK. Yeah, so I'm the author of yama.clj, which is a wrapper for uh, yama.cpp. So when Facebook's uh, Yama um, LLM got released, uh, leaked. Um, 
there's a lot of work in the open source community to start using it and figuring out how to basically start running these LLMs locally. Uh, subsequently, Facebook openly released their Yama2 LLM, so you could run that locally. And in the open source world, there's a lot of research now building around kind of the models and formats and tools that were built to work with the leaked model that are now uh, is now kind of freely available. And uh, there's a lot of other work being done and just piggybacking on all of that tooling. So Yama.cpp has really great Python bindings and Ruby. Um, and there's a lot of work. Um, it's being used by the ecosystem generally to kind of access all these local LLMs. And then the local LLMs, um, more people are making them because more people have access to them and can play with them. So anyway, I wrote a um, high-level wrapper for Yama.cl or for Yama.cpp that you can use just from Clojure. And so now you can run these LLMs locally. So there's Yama2, which is uh, the one that's kind of being used for this demo and it does a good job, but there's the, one of the cool thing is there's like, um, there's new LL, new models being released regularly that are tuned for different tasks and have different capabilities and require different hardware resources. Um, I use the 7 billion model from Yama and Yama2 in this example, which you can run, um, you know, you can run it on your laptop. I, the, this page was generated by the uh, Linux CI image on GitHub. So you can run these tools with really modest resources and they have bigger models that require more resources if you want that. And they have even smaller models that can run on even more modest resources, even without GPUs. So I think one of the appeals about LLMs is that they're very general and they're kind of pretty easy to understand and they have really flexible use cases. So um, I wrote this document that helps you kind of get started with um, running LLMs locally. I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just going to hit the highlights. And uh, the one, I know there's a lot of experts here, so this is probably redundant. Um, and maybe somebody can uh, fact check me on this. But basically, when you're running these LLMs locally, there's really only one thing you can do. Uh, I call it the, there's only one basic operation, which is that you give it a prompt. You, you give your LLM a prompt. And uh, what it gives you back is um, a list of probabilities. So um, you give it a sequence of tokens and it will predict the very next token. And for any pop, so there's, um, and it gives you the probability that any token will come next. So just kind of as an example, um, if uh, here we have closure, we have the prompt closure is a, and then it'll, um, and then we can ask it for the very next token and it gives you a giant list of probabilities. Um, Yama2 has 32,000 tokens, so it gives you 32,000 probabilities, one for each token. And the top tokens are programming, dynamic, modern, relatively functional. So you can see that uh, those are obvious, or those are likely continuations of closure is a programming, closure is a dynamic, closure is a modern. Um, and then you can also, but you know, it gives you the full list of probabilities. So you can also see what's the least likely. So closure is a poor tail, closure is a zygo, closure is an accuracy. And you can see that those don't make any sense. Um, and so that's one of the things that running LLMs locally that's kind of interesting is that you get the full spectrum of possibilities. Whereas when you use these via the API, they kind of like, they take those probabilities and choose them for you. And um, so as I said, there's really only one thing you can do with these local elms, which is predict the very next token. The way you get these full responses is you predict the next token, you select the next token, you feed that back into your prompt, and then you do it over and over again until eventually um, it predicts that the um, there's a called end of sentence token, but basically it predicts that it's done. So that's really the only thing you can do with local. Uh, that's really the only one operation you, you can do with it, but it's kind of easy to reason about. It's very flexible and very useful. Um, and so there's some other examples of kind of like, um, so one application is the chat interface, which is kind of the most popular way people access LLMs, but you can, uh, there's an example like a goofy one where you can generate run on sentences using the LLM pop. There's one where I can strain the, um, so you can select the next token 
as it's predicting. And so instead of um, trying to pick the best token, you pick the best token that satisfies a particular grammar. So here I use the LLM, LLM and I require it to only produce responses that fit the JSON grammar. And so you can do things like that when you're running locally, that's maybe more difficult to do if you're running via an API. Um, here I wrote a simple classifier where basically I set a prompt to ask it um, to describe a sentence as happy or sad, and then I give it the sentence. And then I look for, um, and then I just check the very next tokens that it would predict it. If it predicts happy, I say it's happy. If I predict sad, it predicts sad. Um, and so here's a table where I compare, where I give it a bunch of prompts. And so, um, and so you can kind of see, this is also an example of where um, if you're using V and API, you don't necessarily have a lot of model choices, but if you go on Hugging Face, there's lots of new, there's just a lot of models that are available that people are working on that give you really great results depending on what you're working on. So the Yama 2 that was released by Facebook has this like a weird um, tendency to try to be really positive. So no matter what you ask it, it's basically like, yeah, that's happy. Um, I really struggled to find any example where it would say that's a sad sentence. So drinking poison is like the only thing that it thought was sad, but um, sitting in traffic is happy, debugging race conditions is happy, uh, according to Yama2. But the Yama2 Uncensored, which uh, was released on Hugging Face, where people went and tried to have Yama tell you exactly what it was thinking without holding back, it actually does a really good job. So. It can different, differentiate between crying in the rain and dancing in the rain. Um, dancing in the rain is happy. Crying in the rain is sad. Uh, programming with monads is sad. Programming with closure is happy. Um, and so it does a really good job. And so this is one of the flexible use cases. And I think there's a lot more that can be done. So I'm excited about the possibilities, um, both in being able to choose different models and just having raw access and being able to do all of these things locally. Um, Three more minutes, by the way. Great. And uh, yeah, so I think I'm, uh, yeah. And the other thing to point out is, uh, you know, this example didn't take very long to uh, produce. So there's a lot of um, information packed into these models that you can access. And since there's only one basic operation that you have access to when you use these models, it's really a flexible and powerful model that you can use. So I think. Um, you know, and the other big reason to um, run these models locally is privacy is that, you know, you can, um, if you have your own personal data and you don't want to be shipping it over the internet all the time, or you have customer data or internal business information running LLMs locally, that's um, another benefit of running these things locally. And it's, it's fun. So I think um, that covers most of the highlights. If uh, you know, if you're interested in reading more, um, I've shared this document that kind of has the code and explains more in depth. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Oh, real quick, I was wondering, how powerful is the laptop you're running this on locally? Or do you yes. also use... VMs, do you like uh, provision those for this or? So this is a, just my regular MacBook that I do. It's a MacBook Air with an M1 chip. So it's not, um, and it, and Yama.cpp will take advantage of the um, GPU that I have, but the um, the actual web page that's being rendered here, um, I had it, um, I ran it in the GitHub CI. So I don't know what um, VMs that they're using in their CI, but I don't think they're that great and they don't have GPUs. So you can run this with a CPU. Um, it's, you know, I mean, you can play around with it. There's different models, the 7 billion model. Like I think this page, which actually does quite a bit of um, work to generate, I think it takes about 25 minutes on the GitHub CI, whereas I can do it locally in like a minute or two. So just, um, this, I think the code to build this page isn't 
optimize for performance. It's really just to optimize for the text. So I think there are ways to improve that, but that hopefully gives you a sense of the hardware requirements for this example. Thank you so much. Uh, we have more time for brief questions or comments. Oh, Rupert, maybe you was... Yeah, have you tried this uh, JSON coercion on APIs actually, not on the local one? The um, API section? Yeah, like, no, no, I mean, um, I understand how this is done on uh, when running locally, the coercion of output. Have you experimented with something like that for the APIs, like uh, OpenAI or the same call here? And uh, maybe you tried some ideas because. Um, well, so, I mean, that's one of the differences. I think, mm. I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not where, I mean, I've used some of the APIs and I think they have, I've only really used their chat interface, but I don't think they actually give you the weights for every single token. So this is only, I think, feasible if you can actually get access to those weights. I think you can probably try to do this with the um, fine tuning, but I haven't, I haven't tried that. We do have lock probabilities where you can influence certain tokens as well, but it seems like too, too constrained an approach. You have to pre-list all the token probability lock props and so on. So I'm not sure that would work well with hoping AI and similar things. But yeah, that's the true problem that there are no good, uh, I think there are no good approaches, like solid approaches. Yeah, and to be clear, I mean, so even for Yama too, if you ask it for JSON, it usually does a pretty good job of giving you JSON anyway. Um, mm. So I'm not actually sure this is the best use, but I think it's an interesting example. So I think this is an area where like, um, yeah, I'm not sure what the best, if mm. this is a good idea or not, but it's interesting and hopefully uh, this is a really uh, interesting area for people to explore um, and find out. And have there been any benchmarks of just how close this gets to like the closed source ones like GPT and such for output? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the resource community, like if you go on Hugging Face, there's like, um, there's some links here to Hugging Face, maybe I should add some more. But basically, yeah, I mean, there's like, there's like a leaderboard, there's lots and lots of stats comparing these and lots of different metrics. Like, you know, there's research being done and this is the open research area, which is kind of interesting because compared to these closed models. And so, yeah, you can, there's a lot of stuff going on and you can find uh, really detailed comparisons and people are working on ways to evaluate, working on new models, working on new tooling and everybody's um, joining in on the fun. I think uh, Rupert was going to say something. Yeah, sorry, I did have you on earlier. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, I've been using Llama CLJ. It's been working really well. Um, I think one thing you haven't really sort of mentioned, which I, I think is um, how you how you manage to achieve this, because this is not a thin wrapper that we've got here. There's some other libraries, your Klong library uh, that you've done. So maybe you can just touch on that briefly about how you're able to get, you know, Llama CLJ, Llama C++ is a C++ library. How you're able to get a, a good um you know closure wrap around that. Yeah. So um I use a I have another library called Klong. And what it does is you can give it some header files and it will um spit out um basically you can turn header files into data, which gives you access and um for all as long as these um libraries offer a C. API like a that adheres to the C ABI. Um, it's really easy to load the library as a shared library. And then um, I mean there's multiple options. I use closure J or I use J and A, which is a really stable option. I think there'll be better options in the future um, built into the JVM. But um, basically that lets you call into shared C libraries. And what Klong does is you you basically ingest all these header files and it spits out a data model of the API. And then I use macros to turn that 
data description of the API into a closure, like uh, closure functions. And then I build a higher level API on top of that. Um, I'm not sure that's the best explanation, but basically, um, yeah, the CABI, you have function calls and then it has the, the name of the function, the data, it, um, the, the arguments and what it returns. And you can turn that into um, just closure function calls that you know take ints and return ints or whatever. Yeah, that's great, thanks. That is great. And I think Tim, you hoped to say something or ask something. So if you think it is brief, then we can make it now. Otherwise, maybe after all the talks, what do you think? I just wanted to say thank you to the other question askers because those are some great questions. It's really exciting to know that this actually can run fairly performantly on Apple Silicon, even the basic version. So no fan required. Um, and uh, I was gonna ask for the link, but it looks like somebody just posted it. So everybody star this because uh, GitHub stars are love. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, Adrian. And uh, yeah, and we will share the links in the you know notes of the recording. Um, and Cameron, would you like now to uh, tell the story of multi GPT? Sure um, thing. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, um, can you see my screen? Ah, yes. Can you see that? Can you see the presentation? The slides, yeah. Okay, good. One moment. Okay, um, let's see. So, multi GPT, probably a terrible name for this project. Uh, it was like related to some interest in agents. And so, you know, the idea was like some kind of toolkit to have multiple instances of GPT doing things. Um, admittedly, I'm uncertain about the future of this project. I was working on it around the time of the conj, like in April, and then the conch happened and then I had to find a job. And so I haven't gotten back around to working on it, but still interested in it. Um, about to move across the country. So maybe after I get settled, I'll, I'll get back into this stuff. But what kind of kicked it off was getting super interested in, in GPT-4, like chat GPT. And it's very cool. Um, and, and then seeing like the default uh, kind of way of, working with GPT programmatically, turning into like a Python thing, like Langchain, which is cool. Um, but of course, as a Clojure developer, it makes me think like, well, that's just like text in and text out. Like that's not, you know, if anything, like Clojure would be awesome uh, for the exact thing that, you know, Langchain does. And then of course there are probably like avenues where you would want like interoperability or something with Python. And like, so it's cool that like, I think it's CLJ Python or something like that exists to do some interop there. but you know, why not put closure in the driver's seat for some of this stuff? And I'm also working sort of part-time with a company in the Philippines. They're like a home services provider and wanting to like sort of switch out our interface, um, like our conventional like mobile app interface with like an assistant based interface to where you could say like, you know, I want my house cleaned at 5 PM next Wednesday. And by the way, I want to do that every week. So like we're the intention of multi GPT was to kind of like start working on a tool that we could fold into that work and have our closure interface to open AI. Um, and then another aspect of it was since I build software, it's like, uh, I've been interested in like sort of using, um, GPT four as an assistant in sort of the design phase of the software, um, and kind of like generating these plans and then, uh, asking it to like, once you drill into the bullet points to those plans, kind of asking it to generate, all right, we'll generate this piece and that piece. And I can try to put them together. Um, and so, yeah, this was also an exercise in building LLM tools with the help of LLM. And uh, so like the, what multi-GPT kind of provides or aspires to provide in some cases um, is a sort of like suite of layers that kind of stack on top of each other that become more complex as you stack more of them. So. Um, we have the core API down at the bottom right there. And that's that's just your HTTP interface to open AI uh, to their API. Um, but then that becomes useful to what I've called the conversation manager, um, 
which keeps track, it kind of does what it sounds like. It keeps track of multiple conversations, just like your like a uh, chat GPT interface, like you have multiple threads, right? So it's really like a big uh, atom with a map that it, every key is like a conversation ID. And then the value is the like the messages in order. So um, in a sense, it's conversational memory, which you need to have uh, some of those like Q&A conversations with like uh, the LLMs, you have, kind of have to ship that full context back and forth. So the conversation manager makes it easy to start a new conversation. So you've got a clear context, send some messages, um, keeps track of that. Um, currently, we just have an in-memory one for multi-GPT, but as I'll talk about in a second, it's kind of protocol driven. So like the goal is to, you know, maybe swap in another database, like a persistent store or something, so that it'll, there will actually be like um, a durable level of conversational memory. Um, and so then kind of going up to the task manager, this is where I started to get into agents. And then I realized like, I'm not sure I want to do that right now. Um, but basically the task manager is the kind of thing uh, where you like, you tell it like, hey, um, organize a children's birthday party or something. And then it, it knows it's supposed to like carve that request out into like maybe like five to 10 steps or something. And then all of those uh, are supposed to be sort of sent and passed through uh, the LLM and like, you're like aggregating the steps. And of course you quickly run into the fact that like, you really need like external tools, I think to make agents useful. Also a lot of thought probably needs to go into the design of like an agent system. So what we have right now is exactly what I described. So you have a task manager, and you can ask it for something and it'll use the conversation manager to start different threads of conversation for each task. Um, and then you'll get the results back and it kind of rolls up into like a special task manager view of what's gone on in the conversations. Uh, but you can like look inside the conversation manager and see all the conversations that have happened. So it's kind of like stacking uh, complexity. So like you're doing HTTP, then you're managing conversations, then you're managing tasks. Um, and we don't have agent yet, but, you know, of course, agent is, that was sort of the original goal. Like the agent would then somehow use the task manager to do more complex things. And there's also probably like a, um, there's an external tools like component that's missing here. Um, Cause the agent kind of like open AI function calls uh, needs to know when to like call out to an API or like do something that LLM is not good at. Um, and so then the other component of this was the REPL interface. So wanted to have some functions uh, available to kind of make use of all of this stuff. Um, yeah, and so the way that I kind of approached building uh, this multi-GPT with LLM was to think in terms of protocols because the model seemed pretty good at that. Like you, do, you, can, you start by planning at a high level. And so protocols are a pretty good way to group functionality in a high level. So like, it, it makes it easier for the model to not get into the weeds. Like you can say like, let's just keep this at the closure protocol level. Um, no, don't generate any other details yet. And so you can start to kind of like mold um, the shape of things. So like for HTTP, we probably just need to send requests and parse response, a conversation manager, you want to create conversations, get a conversation update, which is basically like a chat, like you're, you're updating the context to send through. And you might want to end a conversation. Not so sure about that one anymore. Not sure it really matters. Um, task manager, very similar, like create tasks. You got to generate the subtasks, process the subtasks, uh, which is really right now, like just iterating over uh, the subtasks and then calling generate subtask result, which ends up like sending that subtask uh, context and query to the LLM and then agent, yeah, who knows. And so, like, the major inspiration for, like, the third, I guess, inspiring uh, thing. Three, like, three more minutes, by hmm? the way. Three minutes. Thank you. Three, three minutes. Sure. Uh, the main, main inspiration was this paper, uh, Generative Agents, uh, Interactive Simulcro of Human Behavior. I thought that th this is a really cool model, and I want to see, like, a, I want to see, like, a closure project that properly encapsulates this whole, like, perception memory stream, which implies external memory storage and, like, embeddings. Uh, retrieval, planning, and reflecting, um, and acting. If you haven't read this paper, I'd recommend it. They like, they created this, um, they did a, they like recreated a video, like a 2D game world, and they're like simulating like human behavior. Let me find a good picture. 
um, they have like a little town and people and like they use this um, reactive memory architecture to kind of simulate like human behavior. And I kind of, I wonder like how that could be applied in the sense of like, if you have a customer and an app and it's your, you know, the model is their assistant and they remember the things that happen and they can even reflect and like plan for the future, how that could improve like a customer experience in a product or something like that. Um, and yeah, yeah, like one, one minute. So I can try to get through a little demo here. So, um, let's see, start ripple up. This won't take long. It might run over a couple seconds. Um, so this is very like infrastructure level stuff. Like there's not a whole lot, uh, of flashiness going on, but it, you can hook it up to portal, um, the tap set up a system, which kind of sets up a conversation manager, task manager, um, and the core API stuff create a conversation, set up a sort of like a, a convenience function, like chat, because you're going to be updating the conversation, um, add a little tap to print out to portal for whenever things change. And so here I'm going to tell it like, okay, system role, like first message, basically, you're a booking assistant for house cleaning app, you know, you'll collect some information. And then it may come over multiple messages. So you have to, you know, keep track of that. And then once you figure out a, a request is complete, then confirm the booking now and ask for help. Um, this might take a second. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so hello, how can I assist you today with your house cleaning needs? You know, need my house cleaned next week at 3 p.m. Um, of course, and then it knows that it needs to ask for, you know, uh, my na full name, oops, sorry, full name, address, phone number, and the number of rooms. Um, yeah, so. I'm not going to continue with the demo just because like I'm not trying to show off like an actual like housekeeping flow, but that's the idea. Like you can see the messages coming through the conversation manager. It's kind of like a replica of the chat GPT interface, but for your REPL. And then the point is like to build up over time to create this like generative agent thing that does that um, memory stream retrieval planning and reflecting thing. Um, so yeah, that is it. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and I think yeah, if we had more time, it would be good to see more of the code. And yeah, and maybe in a moment somebody will ask about it. Yeah. So does anybody have any question or comment briefly about multi G? Share the. Oh, yes, I can share that. Yeah, so uh, actually, Cameron, if you have like a minute or two more to show just a little more of the code, I think it would be enlightening, unless anybody oh. has an, uh, yeah. Sure, uh, sure. I'll share, um, okay, yeah, perhaps that is the link to the paper that someone shared, thanks. Yeah, let me fire my sharing back up here. Are we good, can we see? Oh, no, we cannot, oh, sorry, yeah. You can now? See, we see nothing. Oh, nothing. That's fun. Yeah. Let me try yeah, again. Yeah, so, yeah. All right. How about now? Yeah. Good? Yeah, no, it goes. Okay. Yes. OK, cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So in terms of the code, it's, it's really not much to it right now. And oopsies, um, on some level, it's not as like, it's not as crisp as I would like it to be, uh, but that's part of like designing with LLMs. Like you, I, you kind of can, you choose like your level of crispness, like, you know, like, okay, that looks pretty good. Like we can try that out for a while. Um, but yeah, so basically we have the core API, uh, which is just defined as a protocol, send request, parse response, text in, text out, you know, um, or in the future, maybe you're doing a thing that is like, like for our application at for the company I was talking about, like we're trying to constrain it to speak to us in JSON. So we're actually like split, we're creating like a split communication stream. So you might do more in parse response that involves like uh, taking like a data structure back that you're getting back and like figuring out what you're, what you're going to show the user and what you what you might need to like call a function with or something like that. So uh, ostensibly you could like not only use open AI, you could like, implement a different protocol or like the same protocol for a different um, like cohere or something like that. So this is just your bare bones like wrapper. And then the conversation manager, um, it has a pretty simple protocol. Uh, and 
so this is all in memory, um, just used as an atom, uh, creating conversations, getting conversations, updating them, ending them, which may not be useful. Um, and so you could, you know, switch this with like a XTDB conversation mem uh, manager or something. And so now you're getting into like long-term persistence of, of conversations and context. And the, my, my thought is like, so your conversation is like uh, when you're having a conversation with an LLM, those are its memories or its perceptions. If you see, if you go and you check out like some of that paper, you'll see like those are its perceptions. When it does stuff, it's creating memories. Uh, the conversation is kind of like a rough stream of memories. But then you can like, once you have durability, you can take that memory stream and start doing other stuff to it, like to it, like classifying each one as how important it is or how relevant it is to a certain topic or things like that. And you can create this more like refined memory stream. Um, and so eventually like I'm going to add like a memory stream component to this. So it's, it's going to be like kind of feeding off of this conversation manager. And so at some point when it gets to the point of like multi GPT support, some kind of agent concept, uh, when the, when you interact with an agent, it'll be like retrieving memories that are relevant to what you're talk talking to it about. Um, and then acting based on that somehow. Um, and then the task manager is really, uh, it was an interesting, like sort of, it almost seems kind of futile and pointless like the task manager, cause it doesn't really do anything. It will totally tell you the steps to like organizing a kid's birthday party, but it doesn't have any like communication with the outside world. And when you start to work on something like this, you realize that there's like a, there's a whole, it's like a DAG, like a, like a, directed graph kind of thing like you actually need like some orchestration and you need some dependency management on tasks tasks you can't just like you really can't just like fire off like a bunch of tasks and expect a good result out of that um that's kind of like the first step and then you you need to organize some dependencies between those but yeah so we like you can create a task um it, it's basically like uh telling this thing like oh i want to do this um then you uh you can you're the it has like a sort of like a few shot thing going on here so when you take a task you're going to generate subtasks off of that and so you're telling it like you can give it some examples of like how you want it to do that without being too redundant so like you say like you're going to break down the following task please ensure uh that it, the subtask is restated in a way that's aware of the primary task but won't lead to redundant results please reply with a closure vector of strings which is kind of interesting it's you can definitely tell these things to like respond in a data format. Um, and then you, I kind of gave an example, like organize a children's birthday party, you know, and you might decide on a theme, send an invitation, select a location, come up with games. Um, and then you kind of give it the final instruction here to like break down the following task into subtasks. And so it'll do that. Uh, then you'll get back like a sort of a vector of subtasks. And that's sort of what process subtasks is doing. It's just saying like, okay, well, I see that and I'm going to I'm going to generate a subtask result for each of those. And when you generate the subtask result for each of those, you're basically sending those back into the LLM. So you've got your like, you have your sort of like planner that's saying like, okay, you need to do one, two, three, and four. And then you have your like, your actual execution of that. You're sending one, two, three, and four into the LLM. And then what you end up with is kind of like this vector of like, okay, here's all the stuff you asked for. And, you know, you can see how that would, uh, if you um, were a bit more organized and had better design, like you could have this sort of dependency management thing where you eventually you ended an end result that is related to the the first thing you asked for, it kind of splits everything out into a tree. Yeah, and, um, and, and it might yeah. be a good moment to conclude. And thank you for this sure. you know, co yeah. code well, story. Hopefully that was story. interesting. Yes, it was. Yeah, thank you so much. And it is kind of anticipating the chat we'll have afterwards, maybe. And yep. yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe it is a good time to move to Rupert, if it is okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, is this coming through? Yep. Great. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do with this session is to just introduce you to a project which is being run on the Clojarian Slack. Um, I'm involved, John's involved, there's a few people involved in this project. Um, and we're also making use of a bunch of libraries that, um, you know, we've seen today like Llama CLJ. So, um, you know, it's sort of a, an ecosystem approach. And, and what this project is, 
is to um, uh, is to not just be able to use LLMs in Clojure, but to actually have LLMs reading and writing Clojure. So um, we see Clo if we see LLMs being a major path forward for the way that programming happens, uh, how software is built, um, how programmers' jobs are, are, are done in future. And we want Clojure to be part of that, that future. We, you know, if, if um, let's say Python is the only language which LLMs can read and write, then that might become, let's say, the most, you know, most important language. So we see it quite important for the uh, Clojure language that um, it's able to take part in this sort of uh, AI coding revolution. Uh, so that's that's the idea of this uh, of this project. Um, I'm just going to sort of start with a few concerns, objections that people might uh, have when they hear about AI writing code. So uh, first thing people might say, well, there's going to be tons of boilerplate and low quality code. Um, yes, uh, that can happen, but you know it's it's in the control. You know the, the machining, the LLM can be controlled. It can be fine tuned. Uh, agents can be built around it. We can. Uh, overcome some of this boilerplate generation. And obviously, you know, we're really at the start of the LLM journey. You know, um, transform models have only been around for a few years. Chat GPT is only since November last year. We're such early days that, you know, we see a lot of potential for the quality to increase over time. Um, a lot of the other issues like reinventing the wheel and, and using libraries correctly can only be overcome. Uh, another objection might be that, well, this is all centralized, you know, open AI, uh, have a monopoly on this. It's all. It's none of it's open source. Uh, well, actually, that's all changed. You know, there is now really powerful open source uh, models that are general purpose models, but also trained particularly for coding. Um, and so, um, I think um, you know this can be an open source approach, and it doesn't have to be centralized. You know, these models will work on developers' laptops, developers' PCs as well. Um, and then the last one really is, you know, will this take away programmers' jobs? Um, you know, hopefully not. Um, you know, I love programming, enjoy it. I know lots of people who do. So uh, I see this as being a way to enrich, uh, enrich the way that we work. Um, and even if that's not the case, you know, we need to sort of see, we need to sort of explore this space. Uh, and I think closure is a good language uh, to do that with, uh, with LMs. Um, Onto, onto why why I think Clojure is a good language for LLMs. Uh, it's concise, um, it's high level. You know, uh, if you've got a LLM spitting out lots of code, I'd like that to be something that's, you know, elegant and nice to read, not, you know, thousands of lines of loops and if statements and procedural code. So I'd much rather, you know, read, read generated Clojure than generated other language code. Um, it's simple and fast to learn. Uh, it's actually, you know, it's fast execution. It's built on top of the JVM. It runs very fast. If you're going to generate code, you may as well generate fast code, basically. Uh, it's got a great ecosystem, um, you know, through the JVM, through JavaScript. Uh, we've got access to, you know, more than enough libraries and capabilities. Um, so it's, you know, a good language for that. And then lastly, it's actually very stable, which is very useful for LLMs because LLMs don't have a great concept of time often when they're trained. So... Uh, an API that's constantly changing, um, the LLM may not understand the differences. Um, so um, the fact that Clojure is is so stable that you know your code that you know was written for Clojure 1.2 still works in Clojure 1.11, uh, that's going to be a useful uh, aspect as well. So how are we going to you know ach achieve this rather bold uh, objective? Uh, there's four work streams going on um, here. Um, and I'll just take you through the, each one of these briefly. So the first one is data project. Uh, we are assembling as many rich, high quality data sets around the Clojure programming language as possible. This includes um, code from GitHub. Um, it includes uh, training and example code, um, libraries, uh, but also from conversations that people are having about Clojure. So the Slack, Clojure in Slack, um, uh, there's other, you know, Clojure communities online, are grabbing all that data. And that's coming in very raw, that data. So there is a step of sanitizing that data. Uh, and that can be done in, you know, multiple steps. So let me just give you um, just a quick idea of the 
kind of steps we do for that. Um, to sanitize the data, you want to remove garbage, you want to deduplicate it, you want to actually remove outputs which came from the LM, because otherwise you end up with the LLM trained on the LLM, which may not always be the best. Uh, there might be issues around toxicity or bias in the upstream data. Um, PII, which is personally identifiable information, should be removed. We probably don't want the AI to learn that as well. Uh, we also need to defend against injection attacks. If this code generator is generating code, we don't want people to be injecting training set that is a virus into the codes itself. So uh, trying to remove that, uh, anonymization of, of user inputs and so on. So um, a whole pipeline of sanitizing the data and then finally enriching it. You know, We've got uh, steps now using more sophisticated LLMs. Uh, you're able to enrich the data, generate additional examples, um, you know, even just using, um, you know, closure spec, you can generate more examples of code. So we can uh, use that as a sort of data augmentation or enrichment stage as well. So that's the data project. Um, next project is the fine tuning project, which is all about taking the data from the data project and building new, um, new uh, LLMs or fine tuned LLMs using that data sets. Um, there are some very good um, underlying models like Llama 2, um, and you can take that. Uh, you can run a full fine tune on it, um, but you, there's also um, algorithms now like LoRa that lets you um, fine tune um, just a small subset of the parameters of the model. Uh, you freeze the majority of the parameters, and that just means that you can fine tune on a much smaller hardware, um, and it still performs very well at the same time. So that's a fine tuning project. Uh, you can see there's um, paths to GitHub repos uh, as we go as well through these slides. Uh, next up is the evaluation project. So um, if we are you know, training up AIs and we are looking at different AIs that can read and write closure code, well, the next thing we wanna do is actually test them, see which one's the best. And so we wanna build up a leaderboard of you know, multiple AIs that have been built inside the Closure LLM community and outside, you know, um, off the shelf models like Code Llama um, or even, you know, Chat GPT, open AI models as well, and be able to run them on a benchmark of tests and see how they do. So let me just quickly show that um, and show how that works. Three more minutes, by the way. Thanks. Great. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay. So in here, we can take um, some task tasks. So let me just show you what a task looks like. A task is a, uh, a challenge that describes. So here we're going to say, write a function named evens that takes no arguments and returns a sequence of the first 20 even numbers. And so we also have the, uh, you know, an example of the form of it. And we've got a placeholder. We're going to generate, we're going to get an LM to generate the code for this. And then we've got uh, some test sets. And I can see a bug in the test set. Uh, so we, from here, we're going to, um, uh, you know, use use the LM to generate the test and then run the test run the test on it. And that proves that the generated code is able to uh, achieve the task. And then we've got another task here. This one's about reversing a string. And again, we've got some tests to see whether the LLM can actually whether the code generated does that. So let's just have a look at how we run this. Um, let's go into here. So we take the tasks and I'll just print out the tasks there. That's the prompts and the tests that we've already written. And then the next step is we can run, um, we're going to run it through the uh, LLM. So the LLM now is going to receive the prompt and it's going to generate a script. So here you can now see this is generated code. Now I'm running it through a very naive model. This model's not capable of writing good closure code yet. But you can see it's attempted to write uh, closure code. Uh, if I select it and I paste it, it does run. It is actual, you know, it is real, real code here. So we can even um, attempt to run it there. So uh, it's not, it doesn't actually do the answer correctly, but it is runnable code at least. And then the final step is we can run it through an evaluator. So now we're going to just click this REPL. And in the evaluator, we will see how well it's done. So we're now running all those tests 
any tests that fail get printed out uh, and you can see the metrics here. So two tests were run, three were passed, there were zero errors, four failed, and there were no thrown exceptions. So here we can now start to use that as output into our leaderboard. Um, and let me just switch to the final, final last slides, if that's okay. Um, so that was the LLM project, uh, evaluation project. One more thing to say is after we built some LLMs, um, we're gonna need to um, do inference with them. So we need to make use of them. So there's a few different ways. We're gonna provide uh, chat interfaces for LLMs. Uh, we're gonna have co-pilots, which are embedding uh, code generators inside of Emacs, IntelliJ, whatever your editor is, or even agents could be, be created as well. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the project. Um, we are looking for more contributions, more help uh, building this. Uh, so, um, you know, anyone wants to get involved, join us on the Slack uh, and chat to us there. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Does anybody have a question or comments? Yeah, and uh, by the way, yes, uh, there is the Slack channel that probably everybody knows about the Closure LLM Slack channel, which has begun around this project and it has been so active and enlightening and has been kind of pushing this meetup as well uh, in many senses. Um, um, yeah, I had a <clears throat> quick question. And also it's, uh, it, uh, Rupert has been helping me with yama.clj and giving me lots of info and feedback, which has been really helpful. But uh, yeah, the part I'm curious about is the fine tuning. Um, I don't know if you've had a, I'm interest, interested in how that process works and um, how like, and also kind of, so I know that, you know, the easiest ways to work with LM is like, you change the prompt and you get different results. And uh, yama.tlj, I know that you can kind of look at the, you can change how you sample these LMs and that changes how it works. And then kind of the next cost up and difficulty, I think, is fine tuning, which is, I think, still an order of magnitude cheaper than creating your own model, but um, it's still an order of magnitude kind of more difficult than, you know, running it locally. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the fine tuning has moved on so far from this year. There's been um, like lots of breakthroughs. And one of the key ones was LoRa uh, or LORA, which is an approach which lets you uh, train with just far less memory required so that, you know, uh, training can be done absolutely on local machines. If you don't mind leaving your computer running for 48 hours a week, you absolutely can fine tune models on your own machines. Um, having a graphics card really helps uh, as well. Typically you want an NVIDIA one or, you know, sort of an Apple uh, M1 chip. Um, for for, for fine tuning, all you need is a data set where you have your inputs and your outputs. So imagine a huge JSON of pairs of strings, input strings, output strings, and you've got a few hyperparameters to uh, tell the model how to fine tune on this data, which is how much weight to put on the fine tuned data versus on the original data that it learned. Um, and then you kick it off and run it, and then you've got a model at the end of that. So um, uh, yeah, it's absolutely sort of something achievable um, you know, now with these models. Super cool. Yeah, I think this is so cool. I, I think you could do a whole presentation on just this stuff. I am curious, what are the, I imagine it's moving so fast. How are the docs? If I want to like jump in and try to do this stuff, do you have like steps on how to run all this thing or? So, so we're, we're, as you can see, there's lots of different projects and they're all kind of quite decoupled. So the doc, there's different levels of docs and different projects. Um, I think, you know, if you were to jump in, a great thing to do would be to grab a data set and start getting that data set ready or maybe helping with the pipelines um, around sanitizing the data so that we have got clean data to go in. But, you know, absolutely just reach out on the on the Slack and we can help point you uh, anywhere towards, you know, where, uh, where you can get started. Um, once we've got this, we haven't got this end to end yet. Once we've got it end to end, it's all going to be open source, all going to be working offline so you can uh, download this, replicate the results, uh, you know, rerun it locally too. Yeah. Would be one uh, model seven, seven bit model enough for such task or 
because it's very easy to run on local machine. Yeah, so there, this is a huge debate is whether we need huge models going forward, um, you know, uh, trillion parameter models or whether we need small models. That debate is still really hot right now. Uh, there's been uh, an interesting uh, paper uh, only a couple of weeks ago from Microsoft Research uh, around a project called Phi, where they were able to produce a 1.5 billion parameter model, so much less than 7 billion. And that was very effective at text and also very effective at programming too. So um, there is evidence that even 1.5 billion might be enough. Um, I do think though that we won't want to go down to, you know, hundreds of, you know, you know, millions. I think we'll be in the billion stage. Uh, I think there's an interesting observation, which is LLMs learn Shakespeare. They learn French. They learn, you know, all sorts of facts. And, and even all that extra information can help them with their coding. So even though it sounds irrelevant, and it sounds like you don't need to teach all this stuff, um, mm -hmm. the fact that it's got such a diverse training uh, actually helps it to uh, get the task done, which is programming. That's very interesting. I mean, what are the philosophical implications of that? You know, as a human, it helps to learn other things when you, you, you use your ideas across fields, but the fact that it actually even works at this LLM level, it, there, it's, it's still being researched. So it's, it's, it's a question of, yeah, um, but it, that seems to be one of the parts of the breakthroughs was when with LLMs, by scaling them up and scaling up the amount of data that we gave them, uh, they became much more capable. So, um, you know, now we're trying to see whether we can start removing some of that and, and making smaller models. Uh, but that did seem to be quite an important part of the LLMs. Oh, and great slide deck, by the way. I'm pretty new to most of the topics here, um, but it was very informative as far as like trying to understand what you guys were doing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and possibly we keep chatting after the last presentation. And yeah, so thank you, Rupert. And now Sigis will talk about um, Bosque. Yeah, hi. Okay, uh, yeah, last presentations, uh, last presentation and lots of great libraries presented. Um, good, so do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so I would like to start with um, a little bit of the non-technical context, which I think is useful. Sequoia recently released their paper on generative AIs, company startups, and so on. From all the paper, what is very interesting is the chart of, of um, how many users are coming back to use the product. And not that many, only 14% are sticking, sticking to use the products. So my kind of the optimistic uh, interpretation here is that okay, the whole field is moving fast and companies are trying to find this product market fit. And for us as a tool builders, kind of a, we are enablers for those companies to iterate faster, to discover working prog products faster. So uh, let's say we are doing a great job to help the companies move away from 14% closer to the what's uh, what's what's accepted in a more like established uh, technology product like 50% or so sticking around. So I think this is um, this is encouraging and showing a lot of like space for 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 improvement in in the tooling we are we are creating and of course it is still although it's what already a year or so when this technology in generative ai appeared but still it's not like stale every couple of weeks we get uh, new new stuff happening like laura in in um, in fine tuning or whatnot everything is in in constant constant flux so yeah, it's a lot of job to to catch up and provide this solid ground for the application builders so that they can you know build this faster and better. Right. So Bosquet, the directions. Um uh it started a while back as a, I don't know, a playground, my playground to experiment with LLMs. It was uh, largely following what Langchain is doing. 
um but by now it kind of uh, i'm i'm abandoning this broad approach first of all there is no i believe there is no need for generic orchestration llm orchestration platform for the very simple reason that closure itself is an excellent orchestration platform to do that uh we have uh, ecosystem is growing we have uh APIs for Cohere, for OpenAI libraries, yes, for Llama CPP. We we can employ that and plug in into existing closure tooling. So I don't think this uh, very general broad approach is 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 fruitful. Um, and so yeah, kind of the Bosqueta as as a tool is not really going into the. Uh, lang chainish uh, area of of uh, um, broad uh, language I don't know LLM support. Instead, uh, yeah, moving to more towards autonomous agents support. What is actually during the last I don't know months, which is ages in, in an LLM land, is that I think this kind of this picture is is already more or less established as a as a frame to think about how agents are working and also the paper shared here uh, in, uh, about generative agents as well so highly recommended so when we're talking about agents it's essentially we need to understand how to handle memory how to handle tools automatically how to plan actions as plan and, and perform actions. So kind of those four dimensions are critical if if any sort of agent execution uh, framework is to function successfully. So my, my kind of current focus is on memory uh, to, to provide a very good uh, memory support for executing agents. Um, and secondary, I didn't get to that yet, but what is also very critical is guided generation. So that whatever comes out of the of the AI generations is more or less well predictable. So if I want a JSON, JSON comes back. If I want YAML, YAML comes back. If I want Boolean values, true, false, that comes back. So so because agents are reading that, so they have to be more more deterministic. So those two are really, really uh, critical to get right. And who knows what about planning? Actually, I haven't uh, even thought about uh, how to do planning correctly. Uh, in current uh, current Bosquet implementation, there is one uh, pattern supported, um, which is React which kind of plans how to observe, act, and react to, to, to agent actions. So, but this is one, and implemented in quite ad hoc manner. And I want to make it more, more robust, more, more architecturally sound. So this is the, let's say, two pillars of further Bosquet development. First, don't be orchestration layer. layer. And... Uh, when thinking about features, when implementing uh, architecture, think about mainly from the agent execution perspective. That does not mean that uh, Bosquet cannot be used for just you know, completions. Yes, this advanced templating, chaining of templates. It's still here. I might actually extract it as a simpler sub-project, but, uh, but, but this is for later. Um, yeah. Three so, minutes, by the way. Huh? Sorry. Uh, th three I, minutes. Oh, okay. So yeah, quickly thanks. about the uh, updates. So first of all, uh, I added uh, chat mode, so that uh, the whole kind of the chatting interface is, is uh, natively supported. Previously, it was just a uh, completion. Uh, you can re recognize ChatML uh, format. What's actually interesting here, as well, is that with the multi LLM service support, I can specify for which generation. So for example, self-evaluation might use Cohere fast model, which is a name for a simpler model, or smart, which is in OpenAI is GPT-4. So I can configure which generation 
which model to use for which generation, so which, which is quite, quite neat. And this is done with, uh, with uh, integrant uh, configuration. So you can configure different LLMs and then refer to them from, from different uh, generation points. Yeah, so this is the integrant support here. And uh, yeah, the same in the same manner, I'm also handling uh, memory. So memory is pluggable. I can have simple short memory, uh, which is basically an atom. I can plug in uh, more semantically and persistent layer of model, which is can be on vector databases or whatnot. And uh, so as the, the memory is one of the main, main areas now I am developing, I'm also focusing on protocol driven uh, approach. So I'm thinking about memory, which has functions like remember. So whatever goes through the stream of memories for the agent memories, it has to be remembered. It has to be retrieved when needed and forgotten. When I'm talking about retriever, which is also a protocol, depending on the agent, depending on the situation. And this is actually from psychology. We have different types of retrieval. We are retrieving by a queue, which is a query. We are retrieving by the sequence of, of entries and free retriever is just a basically random whatever comes in. So depending on the task, I can choose different retrievers. Also very interesting, this one is encoder. So think about this essentially as a splitter. If I have a long document, I cannot remember it as, as such in my memory, even it will not fit in the LLM uh, context. So I might encode it by uh, splitters, all sorts of splitters, sentence splitters, word splitters. I might actually have even more complex uh, encoders, which draw a graph between uh, entities in my chat. And of course, storage, which is, again, Atom or, or, or vector databases or, or whatnot. So this is going to be a bit complex picture of how I'm thinking about memory. I have a scaffolding mechanics already implemented. And now we're kind of starting to work at the edges here, like adding more encoders, adding more retrievers, different types of retrievers, adding a, at least a couple of storage mechanisms. And my goal is not to support all the vector databases here, which are created. No, I'm, I'm big, like choosing quite opinionated way of, of implementing stuff. So whatever is the most necessary for Q retriever will be used for storage. In, in this case, semantic probably uh, vector database. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm out of time. Uh, but those are the updates of on, on Bosquet. Mem current is a memory stream uh, focus, so I can get everything memorized and retrieved as needed for the for the agent. Well, I rushed a bit through that, but hopefully it was kind of understandable. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for this. And yeah, this change of direction, it is exciting. And... and uh, did you did you wish to add something? It looked like there was more to say. Yeah, so I think it's it's not like a U-turn. It's uh, more like focus of direction. Yes, from from the broader tooling towards uh, towards having a platform aimed at uh, at um, agent support. Yeah, so it will still it still has this you see this platform and and Selmer based. Uh, uh, template handling because in a chat I can fill in slots and then even actually use generate inside the chat so it's all here it's just that uh, when thinking about new features where the, uh, the whole implementation goes it is mainly autonomous agent uh, driven and yeah so that's it yeah yeah thank you so much um any questions or comments about this um, yeah, I was. I've been looking at Bosquet. It looks interesting. I think when when I look at the docs, I kind of I feel like I get lost in the architecture of like how it will be implemented. I think maybe it would be helpful if if you had a maybe an example use case where you can walk through. Here's something. Here's a task I want to do, and then here's how Bosquet supports that. I'm not. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have. Oh example. yeah, yeah. That's that's actually. Uh, I just now kind of finished my first memory handling version, and uh, and now the second task is documentation, uh, like proper, proper like you know uh, documents, examples, and so on. Because now it's some something is in in clerk notebooks, something is in readme, 
and it's also a reflection of me just going all over the place now when I'm kind of choosing a slightly more focused approach. Uh, I'm also uh, updating docs and actually writing them uh, in, in one single place. So yeah, that's a, a promise. By next weekend, I will have a release with, uh, with a good documentation. <laughs> Great. Uh, any more comments or questions about Postcat before we go for the... Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say that this seems like a very robust system in general, and I'm excited to see it being developed. It looks fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Then in a moment, maybe we will go for the general discussion with everybody about anything. We are a bit over the official time and maybe some people may need to say goodbye. So first, thank you to all our speakers. And we will keep going for a little bit recording for the discussion. And then at some point we stop recording and keep going for those who can stay. So does anybody wish to say something before we stop recording? Any concluding remarks or anything? Thing you find important for the recorded part. Uh, I was actually hoping to speak a little bit about the the language models. So my yeah. interest, um, my my PhD was in examining the hidden layers of neural networks, um, and I've got a bit of a theory for the for the language models, which um, someone at Google seemed to agree with. So I think it's it's pretty robust which is that it's learning, it's not learning languages, it's learning these sort of um, fundamental patterns of language itself across all languages. And that's what lets it do these sort of translations between languages. Um, so there's, there's this, um, fundamentally the representation, I think is um, sort of oriented around all all languages and then that's this is based on what Rupert was saying with the phi model being smaller but still just as effective with the the open source language models so it's like you've got llama 8b which maybe has a less deep grasp on on language itself across all languages but then you've got a 1.5b model which is phi which is able to capture sort of the um the priors or the 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 fundamentals of language which then lets it generalize to different tasks better and I just felt like that was a useful clarifying point for like what language models are sort of here to do is like they're here to learn language and then and then that lets them do complete any task because you can sort of generalize everything to a kind of language. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's excellent to say that. Would, do you think that uh, that speaks to like the Chomsky's universal grammar stuff? I'm sorry, I don't know Chomsky well enough to know that. Well, well it's just ironic because like like. Uh, you could argue like that Chomsky's kind of like uh, would take the anti LLM position. Like he's ant like he he's been chasing a pure universal grammar to explain how language works. Like for like you know nearly eighty years or something like that. So it's just kind of funny that like actually the LLM big data stuff may end up proving his thesis. Uh, and what's exciting about that is that then perhaps there is actually an underlying beautiful elegant you know structure there that isn't just like eight billion data parameters or whatever you know what i mean <laughs> precise yeah so i was really shocked to see that he was anti llm because it seems to be right up his alley where but yeah but, but you know what i mean it's not like he, he wants the he wants the elegant like you know proof he doesn't want the 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 big data approach which, which yeah but yeah uh, or, or, or um, it's just, in my work, deriving um, relations, so semantic relations, uh, which describe how the model's thinking is very available. So I, I think if we actually got into the hidden layers of these language models, that that like universal fundamental language could be easily derived uh, from a model that is actually, you know, is able to translate between every language. Let's say it knows closure and it also knows uh, French. And it also knows um, emoji speak, a novel new language that it's created. Um, sorry, one second.
yeah, so it would be beautiful to come back to that at the end or after we stop recording. And maybe in a moment, we, yeah, and thank you for this. Thank you. And it would be great to share any links to papers you wish to uh, kind of share with the group and we include them in the summary. And yeah, and it does bring up some technical questions regarding the way we use the models and whether we can look inside and kind of cache the intermediate layers, which can be so useful for research. And not all the ways we use these things are offering uh, these uh, more detailed uh, access. And so, and maybe we should discuss that too. Um, does anybody, first of the speakers, wish to say something to conclude the recorded part? Can I say one thing real quick? Sorry, I'm not. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, this might be common knowledge in this group, but um, I still encounter a lot of people in the closure community that don't know about Closurist Together, um, which is a nonprofit organization that helps fund a lot of the open source projects in Closure, and they can provide a pretty good, decent amount of funding. So I implore you guys, if you haven't checked it out apply for that because I think it's a quarterly basis, but um, I'll share the link. A lot of really good closure open source projects are supported through that um, financially. And so like it, the closure LLM and stuff, I think it would be a great candidate for that. So if you haven't seen that, um, a lot of people in the community somehow don't know about it still. It is a great organization that helps a lot of closure projects. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. just kind of second yeah. second that because Bosquet is 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 funded by 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 closures together, so and it's really great, very encouraging and and uh, not just apart from financials, just a recognition, this understanding that it is useful. It's it's really a huge driving driving force to to, to bring it. Yeah, great. Thank you for this, Chase, and we will share the link in the notes. And yeah, that's. Anybody have any concluding comments? Um, Cameron or Rupert or Adrian or Sigis? I want to say thanks to all the other speakers and uh, thank you, Daniel, for, for organizing the meeting today as well. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, Daniel, actually, very, very, very huge thanks for you for, for, for organizing those meetings. And then it's it's really also another another great, uh, great help and encouragement to continue working. And it's also great seeing so many amazing projects and libraries uh, being built around LLM, uh, LLM's in Clojure. And uh, yeah, Clojure is an amazing community to, to, to bring that in. Yeah, and I'm hoping to actually use uh, some of the coding uh, agents in, in my work as well, so I can uh, generate and execute Clojure code as well as part of, of uh, agent work. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, so, yeah. oh, hey. Oh, yep, just wanted to say thanks for inviting me to speak and thanks for everyone for coming. I thought all the projects were very interesting. It's cool. Um, I think it's really cool to see other people working on that reactive agent architecture too. And when I saw that paper, I thought it was just a really excellent idea. Um, and yeah, I don't, see, I don't see why Clojure shouldn't be a big player uh, in the LLM community at large, so. Thanks. Fantastic. Yeah, a beautiful way to end. And so to our listeners, now after we stop recording, then the most beautiful part will actually begin. And uh, we will say goodbye to the recording and see you on the next time.